You know, and as much as I, I think it'd be wonderful to have people listen to these podcasts, I'm going to say, um, boy, I would encourage you even before you listen to any of more of the podcasts to uh, those that haven't to read Mr. Banks's, Sidney Banks's six books. I'd say read them twice because the second time through, they'll seem like different books than they were the first time. And I'd encourage you to watch at least the four videos that are free on the website of, um, of uh, Three Principles uh, Global Community, www.3pgc. And I've been told that um, Shane um, Kennedy, from who was a, is a friend of mine uh, from um, the Lone Pine, that he's going to uh, well, uh, then all of the books of Sid's books, six, six, Sid's, six of one of the 10 that have been uh, published are on iBooks now for $10, I've been told. So I don't know if everybody knew that. I didn't know that. And I've heard that he's going to put up on a website all of Sid's videos for people to be able to watch. Uh, and uh, that's a thing in process, but I, I heard that through a good friend of his. Um, so I'm going to give a little overview today of, uh, we're going to talk about schizophrenia, but, and I, my initial thought was to just go into the stories of hope. And I'm certainly going to leave time for those because I've got, I've picked out, I think, and I did them in order of a kind of a given order of my understanding. And, uh, I've, I've picked out, I think four, four, uh, case, four, uh, examples and, and, um, uh, of mind direct experience um, that I thought would be helpful. But, but I want to do, I'm gonna give you an overview. I'm gonna take it, first of all, I'm gonna take it back to the principles so that people see that these are not miracles. They are not um, exceptions to the rule. They are the rule in action. And that universal principles, principles in every field have changed that field universal principles change everything. They explain everything. That's why Mr. Banks, with his ninth grade education, could be asked to come for three different times for three days and talk to PhD physicists from MIT. <laughs> Amazing. That's why he could talk to people of any religion that thought he had read the Quran and the Torah and the New Testament, none of which he had read. But they, because he knew, that's why he could talk neuroscience, even though he doesn't know the details, he knew the principles that applied to neuroscience. So we're going to go back there. I'm going to talk about the schizophrenia diagnosis, just to clarify what we're talking about, briefly, not as if you were medical students, but to give you a sense. I'm going to talk a little bit about the research information about recovery from schizophrenia and what's up with that. It's, it's, it brings some, and then we're going to go to stories of hope. So those are my four things, the principles, the diagnosis, research, and stories of hope. So be, I'm going to go back to the principles. We may have some people here for the first time. I'm briefly going to say, what are we talking about? We're talking about before the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. And if you don't believe that occurred, then, then I, I, you know, all I can say is, that's what I'm going to come from, is that it did occur, as scientists tell us, 13.8 billion years ago. Before that, there was something. There was what I'm going to call divine mind. I'm not even going to fool around with universal mind today. If in your, your head you need to change the word from divine to universal, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But I don't know what else. If people would have explained God to me this way when I was a kid, I wouldn't have been frightened like I was terrified of this, of this mean old person that was ready to punish people. But if I understood that there was before the Big Bang a universal, intelligent, loving energy that was present before any form, uh, and that everything on Earth, and not only on Earth, in the universe, comes from one divine source in, in the... Um, um, in, in the missing link, Sid says, the life force beyond all things has no form, yet it gives form to all things. That's divine mind. That's the, the, the principle of universal mind. 
all life is divine energy, whether in form or formless. If somebody would have shared that with me when I was young, it wouldn't have seemed so mysterious when people told me God was everywhere. That was really puzzling to me. What do you mean? He's under the table, he's here, he's there. If everything that exists has to be made of of one divine energy that was there before there was any form, it makes sense that every everything has to be made of that energy. Uh, you and I and the chair and the desk and everything, but we have the gift of consciousness so we can be aware. Now, what he, what he also said, Mr. Banks said, nothing can possibly be greater or separate from the whole. It can't be separate from the whole. So we're going to talk about people and quote, and I know it's innocent, but they're, these are not people, they are not schizophrenic people. They are human beings. They are divine energy <laughs> that has used their free will innocently to create a, another world because the world they had created with their own thinking and their own, as said, as said in the missing link says, the personal mind is the creator of all misery. All misery. All misery. It's innocent. I did it, as I've told you before. I went in and out of clinical depression for 21 years and saw six different psychiatrists. They were fine people. They were good, loving people. But not one of them taught me what Mr. Banks taught me to live, the, understand the spiritual nature of life and to live in a peaceful state of mind the vast, vast majority of the time. One of the things he admonishes us or advises us in The Missing Link is do not try to understand the words of the wise from an intellectual perception. Not from the intellect. You're not going to get there. He says, listen for a positive feeling. Positive feelings will bring you the answer that you seek. Wow. Listen for truth and look for positive feelings. Not too complicated, not rocket science. Schizophrenia diagnosis. If you go to the DSM-5, it'll tell you that it'll have five things listed. And it'll say that two or more of these have to be present. <laughs> I was laughing this morning. For a significant portion of one month. Boy, they really, really nailed that to the wall, didn't they? Like, who in the hell decides what a significant portion is? Anyway. <laughs> Uh, I would have loved to have been in those discussions uh, for one month period. And one of them has to be number one, two, or three. So what are the five things? Delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, grossly disorganized behavior, and negative symptoms. And I'm not going to go into detail, but delusions. Delusions are fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change even when you give conflicting evidence. Now, some people have pretty fixed beliefs, even politically, that you're not going to change with, with you know, so who, the line between a delusion and a fixed belief can be very, very uh, interesting. Delusions can be persecutory. You can believe that people are out to get you, that the police are following you. They can be referential, that somebody reaching to scratch their forehead, oh, Bill just scratched his forehead, that means he's calling the the SWAT squad in, they're going to come and kill me in the next 30 seconds. Um, they, grandiose can be, I, they, people think they have special powers. And people have died flying because they thought they could fly. Erratomatic, they think that people are in love with them. Famous people are in love with them. And they end up being arrested for following them. Um, bizarre ones are totally implausible ones like somebody has taken out all my organs in my body and replaced them with other organs from somebody else's body and yet i have no scars first of all impossible to do medically but but some are not so bizarre i can believe that the police or the fbi or somebody is following me or that nsa is t tapping my phone they may or may not be but so some things are more bizarre than others. Hallucinations can be visual or auditory or sensory. Visual means that you have a perception of something that occurs without an external stimulus. So you just see something and there's no external stimulus. Or you hear something as if it was a person outside of your head talking to you. Or you hear music, or you can have auditory hallucinations 
that are music. Disorganized speech. It can be anywhere from somebody who kind of loosely associates things to, all, to what we call word salad, where the person is just totally incoherent. I think I gave the example in our last session of a young woman who recovered incredibly and teaches the three principles or has taught with, had taught with Linda and I back in West Virginia, who was in such a psychotic state that she had affected her ability to even speak in a coherent manner. She knew what words she wanted to say, but was, what was coming out of her mouth was unable to be, to be recognized by me, listening as quietly and as, as best as I could. Grossly disorganized be, physical behavior. It can be all the way from catatonic, where the person is un, unable to move, unable to be toil, unable to eat, unable to take care of themselves, to just wildly disorganized behavior. And the fifth one is called negative symptoms. And these, when you think of the principles, when people are overwhelmed by their own thinking, what people do tend to, is either to strike out or they withdraw. And so negative symptoms, people with chronic schizophrenia often have decreased emotional expression, decreased motivation, decreased speech, and decreased social interaction. It's almost as if they've had to pull back they're for, to just survive, to try to survive, and not, they haven't got much energy to do anything external. So what is, the, what is some of the research? The prevalence is about, they say, about a half percent, which would be one out of every 200 people. Onset is usually in the late teens or middle 30s. But they say the predictors of the course and outcome are largely unexplained. And so not clearly relative, uh, be able to be uh, dic to predict it. Because if you don't know what the problem is, then it's going to be hard to know why some people get better. But even in the DSM-5, it says the favorable outcome is about 20% and some recover completely. Gee, what's up with that? What's up with that? If it's something that's broken, how can people recover completely? About 5% eventually kill themselves from their pain. 20% attempt it. A lot of them, a great, great percentage use substance abuse to try to, to l l limit their internal pain. But what was interesting about 1980s, there was a study that came out of Vermont where they studied 269 patients that had been released from the back wards of the state mental hospital back when they did that in the 50s, and they followed them. And at, at 10 years, people were barely making it. But at 20 to 25 years, between one half and two thirds had considerable improvement or complete recovery. Wow, what's up with that? Maybe that innate sense of well-being found a few cracks over time, even as they relaxed their thinking even for a second. Innate mental divine mind is trying to come through every moment of our lives to guide us. So then the World Health Organization made out a study in 1996. Actually, Dr. Julian left from the Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom. And they came, this is the World Health Organization. Pretty, pretty uh, reliable. Huh? They came out with this incredible data that showed in the developed countries like Europe, France, Germany, United Kingdom, and, and the United States, about 15% of the people with the diagnosis of schizophrenia seem to recover pretty considerably, about three out of 20. What was amazing to them was, <laughs> was that in Asia, in Nigeria, and in India, the figures were almost 40%. In the underdeveloped countries, the recovery from schizophrenia was at least double, in some places two and a half to three times more. That was very confusing to people. There was a later study paid for by Eli Lilly, which is a big drug company that makes a lot of money off their medicines for their antipsychotics, and they tried, to, um, they tried to say that that wasn't really true, but 
uh, I think if I had the choice between the World Health Organization, I would go with their data. So now I'm going to tell you um, stories of hope. I do, we've used 20 minutes. That gives us some good, good 30 minutes for some stories, or at least 25, so I can take questions. From a three principles understanding, as I said, these stories are not miracles. They're not signs of Dr. Pettit's brilliance. Believe me, it ain't true. They are, they are the rule in action. They are the power of sharing with certainty the truth. The spiritual truth that we are Everything is divine energy, and we are divine energy in action. We, we actually have consciousness and can know what we are. The first, I'm going to share a, a set of four stories. And some of you have heard the first one, and so I don't know how much detail to go into, but it happened within months after I had met Mr. Banks on April Fool's Day in 1983. And here's a psychiatrist, 26 and a half years of education, who within 15 minutes realizes that this man with a ninth grade education knows 10,000 times more about mental health than I did. I might have been known a lot more about mental illness than he did, but not about mental health. I love, I always go back to the quote of, um, Tolstoy in Anna, at the beginning of Anna Karina, that every happy family is always happy in the same way. And every dysfunctional family is dysfunctional in its own unique way. What you're seeing as you listen to these podcasts is the infinite ways that we can use the gift of thought in a dysfunctional way. And when we do, because of our um, hereditary and because of our uh, social upbringing, we all have different alarm systems. I, I think I mentioned last time that one of the chapters in my book is going to be psychiatric symptoms, un, uh, misunderstood gifts. Because the symptoms are trying to let us know that we've gone off the path just like the rumble strips on the side of the road, let us know that we're headed for the ditch and they wake us up and get us back on the road. So in 1983, when I was at this state hospital in uh, Galesburg, Illinois, where I grew up and where a lot of the research in the 50s was done actually on Thorazine, I was sitting there in uh, 1983 and I think of it, this man would have been there probably close after that because this man in a group that I was doing had been in the hospital most of the time. They might have tried to let him out when he was younger a couple of times and he didn't last long. He'd been in the state hospital for 47 years. He was 67 years old. Since he was 20 years old, he had been hospitalized essentially in a state hospital. He was diagnosed with chronic schizophrenia. He had a whole list of medications. And he was one of 20, about 20 people in a group. And I was talking about the principles as I knew them in 1983. There were no books. There were no videotapes. There were audio tapes. I don't know if I had any at that time or not of Sid's audio tapes from the late 70s, because he had his experience in 1973. So it was 10 or 11 years after his experience, but there were no books. And as I talked, I, again, I know I've shared this, as I talked about the principles, the third week that I was with this group of 25, 20, 20 some uh, people diagnosed with schizophrenia, and the, the social worker, our psychologist, I guess he was, who had told me that I was full of, of uh, excrement uh, as I talked to him about the principles, and yet he kept asking me to have lunch with him and his anxiety disorder started to dissolve. He then invited me to come and talk to his a group of people with diagnosed with chronic schizophrenia. And this one day, this man started laughing so hard that all 20 of us, 22 of us, were holding our stomachs, our eyes watering, 
laughing and having absolutely no understanding of what we were laughing about. Those of you that have been with people or had that experience, it's an interesting experience. Talk about the power of laughter and it, that place that, that it taps into when we're really just, we're just in total joy. And after a couple of minutes, we all started begging her, or I did as the spokesman for the group, to please stop it and let us know what was so funny. But I realized it was futile. I realized he had to, it had to run its course. And I wish I would have had a timer, but it was well over five minutes. It may have been seven to 10 minutes. And finally, he, his breathing started to slow. He stopped, stopped laughing. He got his eyes wiped. He got his breathing back to normal. And when I felt he could hear me, I, I said, Herb, what just happened? What is so funny? I have trouble telling this story without reliving it, just like we all do with memories. It's a beautiful memory because he, Herb looked across the room at me, the clearest eyes, and he said, Dr. Pettit, he said, I just realized as you were talking that I've been making myself crazy for 47 years with my own thinking. And I don't have to do it any more. At that moment, I was not the only person having tears coming down my cheeks, I guarantee you. I don't know that others in the group had the same depth so I don't remember anyone else. I wished I had the understanding I would now. I would have sought out each one of them individually to find out what they heard, if they heard anything. I didn't know enough at that time. And he proceeded, I don't want to take all of the time because I, I want to share these other stories, but he proceeded to tell us that he had at one point gotten to the point where he wanted to die. He wanted to take his life, but the only thing that kept him from killing himself was he was afraid he would be eternally damned and terribly punished by this, this tor horrible, mean God that would do that to somebody in pain. And so it, he, he, he wouldn't kill himself. But he... He one night, he thought that the man in the bed next to him, and they used to have little sections where there were four beds together. He believed that he believed he had the delusion that that man was the devil. And then while he was sleeping, he was going to get killed by this man who he thought was the devil. And rather than being frightening, it, it was wonderful for him. He was going to get relief from his pain without having to do it himself. And he didn't even ask for his sleeping medicine that night. He was so happy that his life was going to end. And he probably lessened his grip on all of this negative thinking because he had an answer. And guess what, folks? Eight hours later, he woke up with a clear mind. This was before our group, 40 year, 46 years before. He woke up with a clear mind and clear eyes and he looked at the man and he didn't look like the devil anymore. And he ended up finding out that they lived in small towns about 15 miles from each other in Illinois there, in rural Illinois, and they both had mutual friends that they knew. And they both had a love for putting, t for tinkering with old cars and making them run after people said they couldn't be fixed. And they talked and they went to breakfast and they went to lunch and uh, they didn't have the rehab programs they have now. So they had all morning to visit with each other. And they went to lunch and they had a wonderful visit and they went to play bingo after lunch. And he had never went to bingo, but he did this time, he and his buddy. And as he was sitting there playing bingo, he 
he said his brain started talking to him. Anybody besides me ever had this experience of your computer brain? Saying, hey, Herb, what are you doing? Well, I'm just he's having this dialogue while he's playing bingo. Just having fun. I found a new friend. I just I feel wonderful. Well, Herb, you're not thinking about your problems. This is not going to solve your problems without you analytically figuring out your problems. You need to start thinking about your problems. He's, he's having this dialogue in his head. Yeah, but I'm just enjoying this so much. Herb, it's not responsible not to think about your problems. You know that. So he said, I started thinking about my problems while I was playing bingo. And within 30 minutes, a mental health worker walked by and I thought that he was going to hit me. So I stood up and hit him as hard as I could in his jaw and knocked him down. And they put me in a straitjacket. And for the last 47 years, I've been in that cycle of listening to my computer brain. I was dumbfounded at the level of insight this man had. And I've told you the story. It took a lot to get him ta tapered off his medicines. He started having terrible reactions to his medicines because he was now at such a, a balance inside that they were foreign bodies. And I got him off all of them. And I, as I remember, I don't know if I'm exactly clear, as I remember the doctor, the head of the hospital said I still had to keep him another three or four weeks to make sure that he was okay. And he was fine. I had a two-year follow-up that he was having a really nice life, going down to the Senior Citizens Center every day and dancing and going to movies with people and playing cards and having a really joyful, joyful, joyful life. So then I go to be with Dr. Roger Mills and Rick Suarez and Dr. Kim Cadu at the Advanced Human Studies Institute in Coral Gables, Florida, about a year later. And while I was there, one of the first things that happened, they said, we've got this young man, since you're a doctor, we're going to have him see you. And he was 16 years old, and he was threatening to kill his parents, and they were terrified. And he had the diagnosis of schizophrenia, childhood onset, and he was on 800 milligrams of Thorazine, which is a high amount. And he had told his parents at times, he said, I'm... I, I'm considering some night while you're asleep of killing both of you, stabbing both of you to death or killing you. I don't know if he told them how he was going to kill them. They were terrified and yet they loved this son very much. So they brought him in and I learned from this lesson from, I'll tell you the lesson I learned. I learned, I should, I learned to include the parents more to make sure they learned what the child was learning. But I was brand new to this. So I talked to the young man, and I, again, I have to, to, to summarize it so much, but I remember one of the initial conversations was about his hallucinations. I realized that his hallucinations were his friends. They were an alarm system that was going off. He didn't, I said, do you hear voices all of the time? He said, no. I said, it came to me as I sat quietly with him, Two things, Kaepman, that his hallucinations are just thoughts with special effects. That's all they are. There is nothing as a human being that we can experience that isn't a thought. I once thought that I saw something on the screen of my mind that wasn't a thought, but it was just a thought in disguise. And that's what an hallucination is. And I, so I said to him, I said, Jose, could you tell me, does your mother ever get upset? And he said, yes, she does. I said, what happens? Well, she gets a little irritable. She has trouble sleeping. And about the second or third day, she has a horrible migraine headache that, that she has to go to complete quiet in the room. I said, does your father ever get upset? He says, yes, he does. Sometimes even watching the news, if it disagrees with him. He gets really upset. I said, what happens? He says, well, he too gets kind of irritable. He has trouble sleeping. And by the second or third day, his stomach starts to hurt him terribly. And he has to take a whole bunch of 
anti-acid pills for his stomach so he doesn't get an ulcer. And I said, Jose, your hallucinations are your mother's migraine and your father's stomachache. They're letting you know that you're doing something with your thinking, with this incredible gift of thought that wasn't meant, meant to happen. To make a long story short, and again, I might have told this before, I gave him some, I gave the family some extra pills of 100 milligram tablets of Thorazine. And I said, we didn't have cell phones then, but I gave them how they could get in touch with me if they needed me, if you needed more than two extra ones a day. When they came back in two weeks, not only had he not used any of the extra pills, on the 800 milligrams he had been on when he came in and he was only sleeping three to four hours a night and threatening to kill them and having hallucinations, he was now having no hallucinations, no threatening to kill them, and he was sleeping 12 to 13 hours a day on the same amount of medicine he had been on before. I said, what do you think we need to do? They said, of course, doctor, it's not rocket science. You need to lower his medicines. We lowered it down to 600 with the agreement they could give him an extra one if he needed it. Two weeks later, he still, as he learned, every time they came, we, I listened. And then I talked to him as best as I knew, as wisdom guided me to. This happened down to 400. And finally, at 400, we went down to 200 because he, he was getting so much calmer inside and the hours that he was spending dysregulating his biochemistry and activating the stress response became less and less. And as I might have told you before, at this point, this is the power of people's beliefs about schizophrenia, that it means you're broken. Here's a man who now was down to 200 milligrams of Thorazine. He was not hallucinating. He was not threatening. He was having more and more joy in his life. And his parents took him away and would not allow me to see him ever again. And when I called them inquiring why, they said, we're going to take our son to somebody who understands schizophrenia. You obviously don't, because we see what you're trying to do. You're trying to get him off his medicines. So we're going to take him somebody who knows about schizophrenia. And in fact, the only reason I had ever lowered his medicines was because he was now sleeping, falling asleep in church, falling asleep at home, sleeping 10, 12, 14 hours a day. But they could not see that because of their beliefs. Now, this young man may have ended up requiring to be on 35 milligrams of Thorazine. He might have. But folks, that's a whole lot different than 800 milligrams. And he might have been able to go to college and might have been able to go to medical school and might have been able to get his, uh, go to psychiatry residency and get his PhD in physiology and become a researcher in schizophrenia at the National Institute of Mental Health. But because of their beliefs, I don't know what happened to him. So let me fast forward. 19, about six months later, I am brought a young woman who uh, had gone to an Ivy League school. She was 23 years old, but she had gone to an Ivy League school at 18. She had left at one after one semester, and for four and a half years, she had been unable to function. She could not, when she came to me, she, couldn't, she hadn't been able to read a newspaper for two years, two and a half years. She could not even hold it together if, if, if you would have come to me, if Elizabeth would have come to me and, and, and she would have been the secretary while I was out to lunch and, and, and said, tell Dr. Pettit that Elizabeth came by from the United Kingdom and I'll be back in two hours, she would not have been able to hold those thoughts together even to get them on paper. For four and a half years, she was unfunctional. She was on Haldol, which is an antipsychotic, Melaril, an antipsychotic, Xanax, which is an a, a, a um, anti-anxiety medicine, Dizipramine, which is an antidepressant. 
She once actually had a dystonic reaction from the Haldol that dislocated her jaw. Can you imagine how painful that would be? And for three days, because the staff oftentimes, sadly, are always looking for patients they think are faking things, they thought she was faking her pain in her jaw until a neurologist walked by the ward one day and realized she had a, she had a dislocated jaw. The family was kind enough not to sue for millions of dollars. I knew, the, I knew relatives of hers through my time in the armed services where a man uh, that I was a flight surgeon for was this is his cousin's child. And all I can say is that after some unbelief, because they told me, we, they called me, they said, we know you can't help because the, this Mecca in the, nor, in the Northeast has told them that she is totally disabled. She'd be in and out of hospitals the rest of her life, mostly in, kind of like Herb. Huh? I will tell you the story. She came to see me. I taught what I knew in 1984. Within eight and a half days, she went back. Within six weeks, she was off all medications. She went back to school after one year, after six weeks, she got a job teaching men's cross country at a college and started a women's cross country team. A year later, she went back to the university. She saw me for three days before she went. I have her on videotape. I said, what was it that, that awakened your mental well-being? She said, when you looked me in the eye, Dr. Pettit, the very first day and told me that I was totally mentally healthy that I was pure divine energy. There was a place inside of me that knew that that was true. And the healing started that day. She went on to graduate with a 4.0 in mathematics and went on to, to Columbia University in downtown New York City for her master's degree. And last I knew she was married to a very fine physician and had three little boys, and her mother would send me every year thank you notes. In 1986, I went over to, Cor to Florida, and a man, the third one, what I learned from that story, by the way, was that I had the mother involved, and on the last three days, I had the father involved. He flew down from Massachusetts, because otherwise, people get scared because of the beliefs that people have about mental illness. In 1986, I had a man as a patient who was admitted because he was fighting auditory hallucinations to kill his wife, to take the butcher knife and stab his wife to death. And as I listened to him, he had had 20, 20 year history. He had 10 hospitalizations. He was on full disability, but he was working full time with his son's landscaping business in Florida. Interesting. But this one time, he and his wife, he, he was on 160 milligrams of loxetane, which would be the equivalent of 1,600 milligrams of Thorazine, twice what that young man was on, which is a large amount. And he, he had an argument with his wife the night before, and he went to work that day, and all he, could do, all he did was think about how right he was and how wrong she was and how angry she was, he was at that she wasn't hearing that he was right. So by the time that, think of that, dysregulating his, his chemistry all day long, eight hours, 10 hours, he walked in the door, she had a big butcher knife cutting up the celery, and the tomatoes for their salad, she had completely let go of their argument. She loved him, she was back in love with him. And what, because of what he was doing and his alarm system, he started having voices saying, grab that knife, stab her and kill her before she can, can defend herself. And yet he, he, he loved her enough that he, he said, you've got to take me to the hospital right now, you've got to take me to the hospital. Huh? He started to hear, he was out within about 10 days. He was out, he, he started to hear to where he got down to where he was on, um, let's see, it was 116th. So what would that be? 100 
he was on 100, so he was on 16 milligrams of, of which was one tenth, or no, he was on 10, 10 milligrams. He got down to 10 milligrams from 160, and he said, Doc, I don't think I want to see you anymore because if I get off all my medicine, they'll take away my disability. I said, well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? He, was, he, he didn't want to come, he, he would get me, let me refill his medicines, but he wouldn't, wouldn't see me anymore. But he's, he, I've got quotes from him. He says, now, if I have any negative thoughts, I know that's what they are, and I just let him go and wait till, my, wait till I feel better again. So I could tell you story after story after story, but those are the ones that came to mind, those four. And again, I, I share them just, just the power of, of just sharing what you know about the truth of these principles. The last thing that some, again, have heard you share, there's a wonderful book called Flying Without Wings by uh, Dr. Arnold Bicer, B-E-I-S-S-E-R. And he's a doctor who in 1950, two months before the, or six months before the, uh, the uh, polio vaccine was discovered, after finishing his internship and winning the U.S. Amateur Tennis Championship, was suddenly found himself paralyzed from the neck down quadriplegic. And after five years of rehab, uh, he married and uh, his uh, physical therapist. And at the time of the writing of this book, he had been in 19, mid 1980s, they had been married for 35 years. And he tells the story, he went back, he was a professor of psychiatry at UCLA in California. And he tells the story of in his residency, being wheeled onto the unit by a man with a diagnosis of schizophrenia who had not spoken a word for 12 years, and a man in acute psychotic state grabbed him and threw him onto the floor. Quadriplegic, he couldn't defend himself at all. The man that had not spoken for 12 years said, stop that, can't you see that he's crippled? He had not spoken for 12 years. But seeing a fellow human being being totally mistreated to that degree and helpless allowed him to let go. It was more important to be a human being at that point than it was to hold on to his painful thoughts that had held him prisoner for 12 years. And it was so powerful. I was talking to a good friend, uh, an Orthodox Jewish man in Milwaukee this morning, and I won't tell that story, but... He said there's a Yiddish expression that what comes from the heart reaches the heart, often reaches the heart. And that reached the heart of that man that had thrown him down in his acute psychosis. And Dr. Beiser describes how the man quickly picked him up, he was very strong, and put him back into his wheelchair, apologizing profusely and straightening out all of his clothing. Because even in his florid psychosis, his place of mental well-being had now been touched by something that came straight from the mental well-being in the heart of the other man who had not spoken for 12 years. I say that one more time as truth. This cannot be broken. It cannot be eradicated. It cannot be scratched. It can be covered over with a lot of tangled thinking, but it cannot be injured. And with that, Your Honor, I rest my case. Absolutely beautiful story, Michael. I, I have to say that. Um, very touching. And I, I've heard new things about Herb tonight. <laughs> Oh, you did, yeah. I heard a few new herb nuances tonight. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I'm wondering, I'm thinking maybe some people could be wondering. Sure. Okay, so, so I can see that thoughts are creating our experience, um, but where do, where do thoughts come from? And where are these kind of delusional thoughts coming from? What, what would you say to that, from your, what, what you see about that? Well... What I see is that as we misuse the power of thought, 
we create, we're creating electrical, we're creating um, biochemical, we're creating all kinds of things. And so to me, the, the, those thoughts, you know, I, Mr. Um, uh, I've, I've quoted George before. George Pratsky says, sadly, for some, death is an early warning sign. My, my early warning sign now, and it wasn't years ago, my early warning sign now is that I haven't had a hearty laugh by noon. I know that I'm taking life way, way too seriously. It used to be that I didn't know that I was taking life too seriously or misusing this divine gift of thought until I either totally destroyed a relationship or I totally did something totally out of my, my morals, or I physically found myself uh, a totally in spasm in my back. Because why? Because those were not the earliest signs. I didn't, if I start having a lot of negative thoughts, and I, I'll have times when I'll have bizarre thoughts of, you know, if somebody does something, you know, the brain will say, you know, you could kill the bastard. Well, I go, well, thanks for your recommendation, but I think I need to uh, allow my mind to quiet so I get better suggestions. <laughs> so I think that I think even negative thoughts are trying to let us know that they're giving us information about the feeling, you know, as, as Sid says, in, in Missing Link, as our consciousness descends, we feel isolated, we feel alone, we feel uh, angry, we feel disillusioned. And, and you either see, and, and people that don't know that those are, are, are wonderful warning signs saying that you're, you're headed for a cliff, slow down. You're headed for a very steep curve, slow down to 25 miles an hour. And if you say, yeah, I'm a really good driver, and you hit that curve at 80, the next thing, your car is rolling five times and you're dead. So I think that it, it takes a whole new way of seeing that every, every signal that we get once we lose a lighthearted, loving, joyful feeling is trying like the rumble strip to wake us up. And like the little child... That, that's at the, I think I talked about this earlier, that's at the foot of the mommy, the little 15-month-old that says to mommy, mommy, well, she's trying to get some dishes done, mommy, and it gets louder and louder until the child is screaming at the mother to get attention. That same thing is our whole body, our whole psyche, our whole being will try to scream louder and louder incrementally doesn't scream right off the bat. It gives us subtle messages. You're going towards the ditch. You're going towards the ditch. You're going towards the ditch. So I think that's what those thoughts are. They're friends, they're, they're wonderful gifts. To let us know that we are going away from our mental well-being. That's all, I mean, that's what I would say. They're, they're evidence of the dysregulation that we're creating. You know, yeah. they're trying to let us know. They're trying to give us a chance to leave our thinking alone. As, as Beverly said, it's not rocket science. Leave your thinking alone until you feel better. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. So all you have to do is stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> So, so, you know, sometimes people, when they stand by, when a train comes into the station and they stand by the edge and they kind of get this flash of, I could jump in front of that train. Absolutely. That's, that's kind of, most people can recognize that experience or have had that experience and right. most of us ignore it. But which, is there any difference between having a thought like that and then having a, a thought, I want to pick up my knife and kill someone? What would you say about you know, that? I don't, that's a good question. I don't know. I was at the Grand Canyon recently with my granddaughter. And we're looking over the edge and, you know, you go, well, it would be a great four seconds, you know? You know, <laughs> be the closest I ever come to flying until I landed, you know? <laughs> I mean, and I go, wait, if that thought starts feeling too appealing, I just take a step back. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't 
try to figure things out very much, Elizabeth. I don't, my analytical mind is good for things that I have a formula and I have all of the variables. So if I want to know if I was lucky and if I need to go to the airport, I figure in how much time I need here. But I don't use the analytical thinking that much anymore. So I don't know. I, I could probably do good by saying I don't know. But, but all I know is that if I know if I know if it's unsettling at all, if, if, I, if I have any, maybe that I haven't had enough sleep, maybe that I've been worried about one of my children or grandchildren. So that thought might have a little more power than I just, if you know enough, you just, you're, it's your brain saying, oh, you don't have to deal with this stuff you're dealing with. If you jump over there, you'll have a great seven seconds and then it'll all, all your problems be, be over. Well, that's the computer saying, by the way, here's an option. Mm. But if you're to the degree you're in touch with your mental well-being, you say, eh, thanks. Thanks for sharing your comments. And I'll, I think I'll wait for a better option. I think I'll step away from the edge right now. So, so what, what I heard there was a, was a real listening into the feeling as a, guide, as a real guide. Uh, we can have all sorts of thoughts, but the ones that are easily dismissible kind of just get dismissed. And the ones that have a, a clear feeling a, alongside them come from well-being and then and then we have ones that unsettle us and there's like leave it alone that's what i'm hearing yeah your feeling level is your is your it's your um it's your um your instrument panel you know as i've told this story about the aviators that had to learn to when they had vertigo and they the body told them they were upside down to not turn the plane upside down because their instruments their instruments said they were right side up and when we get lost, all of us, there's never a time that anybody has ever been angry that they didn't feel they were justified in their own thinking. There's no country that has ever gone to war that in their own thinking didn't think they were justified to doing it. That's why this, this brings hope for the whole, the whole ball game. Universal principles explain everything. They do. And, and it is about a feeling. It's about, like Sid says, listen, don't, 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 don't be trying to figure things out with your intellect. Do not try to understand the words of the wise from an intellectual perception. Or as Einstein said, huh? the, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind is faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Mm -hmm. And wisdom, the wisdom is the spiritual energy that's trying to guide us. It's, it's divine mind. It's universal mind. We are universal mind. We are divine mind in, in, in form. And we're being guided by that every moment of our life. And it manifests. Wisdom is not something separate. It's just the manifestation into form of that internal guidance system that's trying to guide us through life every moment of our life life becomes so much more my wife and i were looking and i it, you know i'm just grateful we're just we were looking at what what we had done this year and we go wow there's no way we could have done that on our own no way but when, when we've allowed ourselves to listen and be guided of, then you just do every day. All I do is what I see to do then that day. Life gets really uncomplicated. And it doesn't mean I don't make plans for the future, but those plans for the future even come from wisdom saying, oh, you know, you should, you should figure out what you're going to do here in the next two months with this or that. Life gets much more, it's just so simple. I I talked to this, again, this man from, from um, you never know. He, he was talking about how his mother told him that since his, his 40th birthday, he had said something to her about worry. And I can't even remember the words. He said it was triggered by me talking about my late wife, Sue, saying, I realize that I either live my life moment to moment, either in my life, which is beautiful, or in my thoughts, my personal mind. 
And somehow he shared that with his mother in a way that she said, I don't know if I ever told you, but say, and it's now a number of years. He said, she said, that day I stopped worrying. And she had been an incredible worrier and it had affected her physically, emotionally, mood wise, everything for years and years and years. And that's what made me think. I said, you know, your love for your mother, I'm sure was behind whatever words you said. And when, when something is coming from love, it has much more, and, and it is truth, it has much more chance of reaching the wisdom in the other person. Mm. And he said, we have a Jewish saying for that. And he gave it in Yiddish or Hebrew. But it, the message is what comes from the heart goes to the heart. And it goes back to what you just said, Elizabeth. It's all about a feeling. What kind of feeling do I want to live in? Does what I'm doing with these gifts that God's given me, is it, is it taking me to a nicer, more joyful feeling, loving feeling, peaceful feeling, or is it, is it taking me away from that? So it's, Beautiful. It, it's not complicated. We, we innocently... And I and underline it's important that we're gentle with ourselves, because we are. It's innocent. We we make it complicated. It's okay. To me, to me, I love Second Chance and Quest of the Pearl. I love those two books uh, almost as much as I love The Missing Link, and they're all good. Dear Liza, I love them. They're, they're all good. But to me, Second Chance has a true meaning because when I make a mistake or I do something or say something that's, and my wife Linda is good. She'll say, you know, I just got off the phone with somebody and she'd say, you know, you were kind of, you were kind of snarky with that person. You were kind of this or kind of that. Well, that's okay. I can't undo what I just did, but if I really, if I see it and if I think I, is an email or if it, it deserves a call back and say, gosh, I, I apologize. I, you know, I, but I, I get a second chance every moment of my life. I can't undo. The past is over. I can't change it. I can't change what I've done. I can't change what's happened to me. The only thing I have every moment is right now. But I get a second chance. I can do whatever I can and go forward. That's, that, you can't beat that. That's really nice. Beautiful. So yeah. I I just want to uh, ask Leela if she has anything she'd like to say before I close off for tonight. Anything for you, Leela? Anything. I have nothing. <laughs> it's been uh, such a rich uh, feeling tonight, Bill. Good. And a very, I think what I want to say is I, I experienced in my heart, what you shared from your heart tonight. Mm. It had um, a lot of hope in it. And I'm just really sitting there and listening to the stories of people who are so confused, but then able to see something about their innate well being, and then, you know, being able to live differently. I just find that so touching. I had, I had, uh, and I, well, I was actually going to read it, but I don't, I'm not going to now, but. I had a thing from a lady in the United Kingdom who's a therapist. She's not a doctor. She's not a psychiatrist. But a lady came to her that had been in and out of hospitals for 10 years on all kinds of medicines and, and all these 10 different diagnoses. And she now is off all medicines. And, and uh, she's back. She's, she's working full time. And she's doing this. The, and 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 her this she had to get a psychiatric assessment for this job and and the person just said this is incredible and this lady was saying i've heard your stories dr pettit and i believe them but now i've seen this woman myself you know and i'm not a just and i was I, i'm not a psychiatrist i don't know about all her diagnoses but i do know that i know about mental well-being and I told her, I told her what I knew about these principles and pointed her to things to, to deepen her understanding. And it was like watching a flower grow, blossom that had been closed in and just opening up to, to completely full beauty. And that's, you know, that's the power. 
That's mm-hmm. the power. You don't have to know about mental illness. All you have to do is know, know about is mental well-being. That's so beautiful. So. So I'm going to bring it to a close tonight. So thank you, everyone. Um, this is uh, the number nine, I think. And next one will be um, a pretty intense subject, suicidal ideation, uh, which we're going to talk about uh, on the 14th of December. Oh, is it 14th or the 10th? Let me, yeah, the 14th of December, two weeks. Well, we uh, did that well. That was a good holiday theme, right? We, we got well, the lights. Some people, I did it. I think so because I think some people looking ahead to the holidays can easily yeah. go back into their memories of past times. So yeah. um, no, I, I think that's true. Yeah. So uh, here's a here's an opportunity to kind of get a different uh, bit of hope in that area. Re- and remind also, us. Remind us of the date. It's the 14th of December. 14th. Same back time, same back channel. And we've added um, in the new year a couple of sessions. We're going to devote one session to kind of recapping on on the chronic mental stress and and how it can create these disorders. But also very much we want to create a space for you to get all your questions answered. So you can interact directly with Dr. Bill and have a dialogue and just anything that's kind of come up for you over the series or anything you'd like to know more about, go more in depth. So we want to devote a whole session to your questions. And then the very last session will be, um, really we want to hear stories from listeners, anybody that's been listening into the series who want to hear what you've been hearing what insights you've been having, and especially if you've been new to the principles, what you might have heard in, in one of these episodes. Or, or you could tell a story of a friend if you passed on a podcast to a friend and something happened for them. But we'd love to get sort of a feeling of, of what's been made possible by this podcast on the last one. Uh, and uh, then we're also adding on the 25th of January a session on chronic pain. It was something that Leela and I and Bill talked about. And we just thought, we, the, the physical symptoms one was, was, was really rich, but that we could also go and really take a look at people that experience chronic pain and how you know, the mind works in that regard. So we're going to uh, add a session on that and we'll keep, you know, that's all available on the Facebook group. So, Elizabeth, for people, how do people tell those stories? Should they, if, should they write them? Should they send a video in? Should they come on to you? share them directly i mean it, it just, it's, it's really it'd be wonderful to have a way to collect those wouldn't it yeah, yeah. you know what you can absolutely send me a, a short video uh, of your stories that would be amazing so uh but then i think we will also have those stories live but a video as well is is i think a great way to go so i'll post about that on the on both the newsletter and the real change portal good idea neil Lila. Maybe we could choose from the ones submitted, you know, if we get too many, that we could choose the ones to share on the on the, on the, on the, on the podcast, yeah. Yeah, so if you kind of keep it to around sort of three minutes, three to five minutes, no more than five, but I think um, we definitely want to hear your stories. <laughs> That's for sure. It would be fine as well. Like, if it was me, I'd be like, oh, I could do a minute, you know? Yeah, okay, a minute's fine too. If you can do it under five, that's better, but no longer then. <laughs> Right. I, I think you can, most people can get their stories out in probably two to three minutes right. from my experience of uh, asking them. So, um, so fantastic. Thank you so much, Bill. And we hope to see you all in a few weeks uh, for the next episode. And of course, you know where the podcasts are. that will be up in the next few days. And we just love that you share them uh, with as many people as possible. We're over 1,500 views now on the first one. Oh. So uh, it's definitely being shared around and people are getting real value from it. So thank you again, Val. Good. Thank you.